you remove that fear of failing, it allows you to take on a ton more risk. And then it's also just a beautiful thing because you don't have to take it so seriously and it doesn't Mm -hmm. hit you as hard. Hi, Kevin. First of all, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So I've been listening to your shows for a while and I really like the random show. And then recently I've been listening to the proof and as well as like more than finance, I feel like you put out such great like content and then you're like super forward thinking. Um, so to start of the show, I would love to just like go back to see how you grew up. I know that you grew up in Vegas, you lived in Portland, Oregon before, and you read about like computers on a magazine. And then you went to a conference which lead you to try to find a job in like a furniture online digital marketing company. And that's how you got to Silicon Valley. So before that, I'm just curious, like, where is your creative energy coming from? And then from your interview you did with Tim Ferriss back in 2014, you mentioned that like, you know, you, you understand like what's like a trendsetter, like a, if a cool person in your class like, weren't a piece of outfit and like, you know, the outfit would sell. And then in general, I'm just curious, like, how do you grow up? And then like, how do you get to where you are? Yeah, it's, there's a lot to unpack there. I think that the interview you're talking about with Tim was one where I talked about probably the first time I noticed, um, in high school, uh, I was not a popular kid. So I was into computers and and back in the day, you know, I'm old now I'm in my forties, but back in the day, it was like, if you were into computers, you got made fun of and like you get picked on. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I was very quiet, kind of just kept to myself and just watched the kids around me. And one of the things that I noticed very early on was that, um, you know, obviously fashion was a big part of like, whether you were quote unquote cool, as I'm sure it still is today. But um, I would watch that there were certain people in my class that were the influential people that could Mm -hmm. kind of set the stage for others. And if those influencers said this was cool, it's kind of everyone um, just kind of went along for the ride. So it was interesting for me to kind of observe because I had a couple of these people in my class, uh, them embrace something in fashion and then watch it propagate throughout the entire high school, which was, you know, a few thousand people. So it was, um, that was the first time I really started kind of paying attention to what the masses and the crowds did around um, looking towards others for advice. And well, I guess this, in this case, fashion advice, but it just really led me to want to figure out how to market to people. Um, who are the right people you should be talking to? Who are these influential people? How do they operate? And, you know, it just got me thinking about a whole slew of different things that led to combining that interest with, uh, some of the tech stuff that I was doing. So, you know, eventually led me to create dig, which is, you know, the influential people were voting up their, their favorite stories, which would then, mm-hmm. you know, the best ones would get published to the homepage. And, um, you know, this was very early 2004 kind of pre Reddit when we launched this. So it was a kind of a novel idea at the time, but uh, it was some of this dabbling and just playing around with, uh, these ideas that, that it was something I was personally passionate about. You know, I don't think it could be taught. It's really just something that like, for me, uh, it was a kind of scratching that curiosity to, to kind of uncover what I wanted to spend time on. Yeah, totally. I'm also curious, like where is the motivation and creativity come from? So right now, like just looking at your, like the proof cover or like the morning finance, uh, I feel like you're super forward thinking, um, and looking at your gallery, collection you've seen like the art block or like crypto punk before everybody else i'm just curious like where is this creative energy and motivation coming from yeah well i i for me it is never anything that feels forced it's always something that has been there in that i've always wanted to play with the latest and greatest stuff you know mm-hmm. so as a kid i was you know installing alpha versions of you know, Windows 3.1 or Windows 95, actually, when it, before it came out, released to the public, I was able to pirate like an early alpha version and um, <clears throat> which is illegal, illegal, but hopefully they don't come after me. But uh, it was, it was, I think I'm out of the statutes, a, a limitation at this point. But I, I think that there was always this like, let me play with the latest and greatest thing. And so it's not as though I really 
always know it's going to be a massive hit, but I know that I'll see it. And if, and if it's, and if it's, if I'm curious enough by it and I stick with it and I see it again, going back to those, who else is touching this? Who are the other influential people that are touching this and what kind of traction do I see? You know? So Mm -hmm. I'll give you a couple examples. Like I remember, um, in the early days of Twitter, when I first got started, uh, we were using it. I mean, it was just a couple thousand people and we were all kind of using it to like pretty much status updates in terms of less like check out this link and, and more like, this is where I'm going for coffee today. If anyone wants to meet up, it was so weird. My early tweets were like, Hey, meet me for coffee. I'm in, you know, Dolores park or whatever, you know, it's like, <laughs> it was, it was different content. You would never tweet that today. You know, cause there's so many randoms yeah. that we just don't know, but it was all people we knew. So I remember them being like, well, this is interesting in that I'm seeing influential people join this platform and it's all tech people, but what happens if a celebrity joins this platform? What happens if someone outside tech? And then I saw a couple like authors and some other people. I'm like, well, wait a second. If this tips, if this goes, you're going to have, you know, A-list celebrities on here and that's going to bring in, you know, hundreds of millions of people. And because it's, it's like, it's a light lift for them. Like celebrities didn't know how to blog. They, that was the only alternative they really had back then, right? So for them to just be able to use a phone and text a phone number to send out a tweet before there were apps, you know, was super simple and something that they could kind of grok how to communicate with their audience. So it, that's what led me to be like, okay, well, let's do an angel investment here. And that's what got me started on the angel side and, and led to my angel investment in, in Twitter. But I, I think that it's always been that. So you know, with the art block stuff, the NFT stuff and the crypto punks, you know, I was playing with crypto punks when they first came out three years ago, minted a bunch of them and honestly just forgot about them. I didn't think they were going to be worth anything. You, you know, December of last year or November of last year, if you just said, Hey, Kevin, I know you got those crypto punks. You want to sell me all 10 of them for like, I don't know, 10 grand. I'd be like, okay, you can have them. Like I, it wasn't like I was like, I, I was super prescient and said, this is the future. I believe in this forever, but I was playing with it. And so when it came back around, and it hit my radar again in January. And I was like, oh, there's some momentum here. I'm like, oh, I get it. It's, being, it's picking back up. It has momentum, more momentum this time. Mm-hmm. There's a, a more diverse audience uh, using it. It's, some of the tools around minting and creation of this stuff have, have been built out. So it's easier mm-hmm. to use. There is a chance that this could go mainstream at this point. And so that's when I was like, okay, now it's time to start getting in, in, into collecting these things because I think this is the audience I've been waiting to see circle around this idea before it kind of takes off. So it's just paying close attention to the signals, I think is the most important thing and, and touching a lot of things and not at a really deep level. Like I touch a lot of things at a really lightweight level just to kick the tires and say, I've used it, but that gives me, kind of helps form my thinking and allows me to kind of marinate on the idea over several months or several years until it maybe turns into something bigger. And I would say that's the way I've treated cryptocurrency since the early days has just been playing around with all the different stuff and tools as they come out and looking for signal, you know, so that kind of hunting for signal um, or watching for signal, not really hunting for it, but just like looking when the right people are all coalescing around something. What is the right people? And then what are the signal that you saw in these projects? Yeah, I think that the right people is um, Tim Ferriss. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, well, that's a funny one. Cause like when I, Tim called me like a month or so ago and was like, dude, these NFTs, like I get it now I'm, I'm all in. And I was like, well, <laughs> okay, cool. Well, you're, it, that's a, that's a huge signal. But I, I would say that, um, you know, there's two pieces. One, I, I look for it to, to finally arrive at a place where the average consumer can interact with it. Hmm. So, um, I, I, things it's very hard to break out a break out of a, a, a geeky kind of niche when it's like, you know, in the early days of crypto, it was, um, you know, you were actually running a full Bitcoin node to like mm-hmm. receive your Bitcoin. You had launched Bitcoin and you downloaded the entire blockchain and you like ran it on your thing. And, and I was like, there's no way my mom's doing this. Right. <laughs> like this time. Mm-hmm. But then, but then you see exchanges and insurance around the exchanges and those exchanges month over month, year over year, gain more reputation and goodwill with the community. And then all of a sudden Thanksgiving dinners turn into account creations. And, you know, you just kind of watch that stuff and you see enough mini bubbles and bursts to know that it's always the, the next burst is always higher than the last burst. 
And so mm-hmm. it's kind of like always trending in the right direction, even though it's choppy, but early markets are always choppy. So that's, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, that just means there's a lot of risk there, which is, which is good. You, that, that's a healthy early market. Um, and, you know, I, I, again, it's just kind of like, I don't know that there's any one formula where I'm like, if this person signs up, I'm in, mm-hmm. it's just kind of looking around and saying, is this starting to creep out outside of my normal handful of 10 really excited early adopter friends mm-hmm. into a, a wider, uh, more mainstream audience and who's talking about it. And, and when you start to see some of those signals appearing, then I jump on it very quickly <clears throat> and then try and go in pretty deep. Um, you know, with NFTs, that was probably January and, you know, I saw art blocks and some momentum there. So I went really hard on buying a bunch of art blocks um, early, which was, was, uh, turned out to be pretty good. But I, I think that, um, it, it's just not hesitating once I do see the signal and, and really going in and, and committing to, to ramping up a, an investment thesis ra- around it. For sure. I was wondering, so when, when you think about these things, like, are, do you view them as like an investment project or like, are you ever going to sell them or are you viewing it as, oh, like, you know, this is my social status because you technically already kind of made it. So not kind of, but like you already made it. So just yeah, I, I mean, the thing is for me is like, um, I, I don't, the reason I don't have a lot of my kind of crazier pieces on my profile on Twitter. And I tend to like put a lot of the up and coming artists. Like I don't have, you know, you can go in my gallery and say, oh yeah, he has a, a zombie or something from a crypto mm-hmm. punk. And we know that's worth a lot and all that. But like, mm-hmm. I try to like, um, I, I love the community. Like I'm, a, I'm, I'm in my core, I've always been a product person, you know, building many, mm-hmm. many products over the years. And so there's a lot of creativity in that process. Mm-hmm. And so why I'm not the final person doing the best um, you know, Photoshop renderings that will, what the final project will look like. I do a lot of the wireframing and the early creative side of it. So mm-hmm. I love the art side of the NFT movement. And so for me, mm-hmm. um, the reason why I created proof, the podcast about NFTs is because I want to help highlight, um, some of the up and coming artists and like really help push this along and educate people along mm-hmm. the way. So it's, it's not, it's not, a, I, I, it's not a money thing for me. Like there, yes, I do consider them investments. And I think that when they become an outsized um, position of my overall portfolio, like if I'm, if, if they go up, you know, 20 X from here, uh, mm-hmm. then I'll probably want to rebalance things just so that I'm not too heavy on the NFT side a mm-hmm. bit. But, um, you know, I think that uh, I don't really look at them. I look at them as something that I would be love to hang on my wall at some point. I never buy an NFT unless I'm I'm willing to um, put it on my wall and 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 hold it, even if it goes to zero. Because mm-hmm. I, I think of it as like these are like little mini angel investments, but they're also something I should enjoy. So if I pay a decent amount for an NFT and it goes down, you know, ninety percent. I'm not pissed because I have something beautiful and I'm going to enjoy it. So mm-hmm. it's like, I, I always think that's the most important lens that's on the NFT side for collectors or new, new collectors is because, you know, these things, it, it, it is early days and it is going to be very choppy and you might buy at the high end of a market, but mm-hmm. if you really, truly love it in your core, then you're not going to sell and you'll write it out. And if the, the collection bounces back, which oftentimes they do, then you'll be in a good place. For sure. Um, so I'm curious, like you are at True Ventures, so you're also investing on the investment funds we have, right? Like when you think about personal investing in NFTs and in all these like cryptocurrencies, like uh, compared to like working with a fund and like when you think about like that strategy to invest in uh, these different projects, like, what are the similarities and differences uh ways of thinking do you use in both of these like kind of situations and we're seeing a lot of corporates such as uh the beer company or like visa they were getting into crypto investment the way that they're getting into crypto investment is sort of like they are purchasing similar to like a random person purchasing an nft right so like what are some some observation that you've seen, like how these kind of like bigger corporations or a fund interact with these cryptocurrencies? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, at the fund level, we hold um, a bunch of cryptocurrency and DeFi projects, Mm -hmm. um, all startups, um, and have done so for for many years now. We haven't been so public about telling the world about that, but Mm -hmm. uh, I'd imagine at this point, our investments are, you know, at least a couple hundred million or more in the crypto side of things. Mm -hmm. Um, We are... 
going to be dabbling in NFTs as well. So it's something that you'll see us playing with um, probably later this year. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, we consider it a, a really important asset class and one that, um, you know, when I look at our strategy around that, it will most likely be how can we go and um, play in this world in a, in a thoughtful way? Mm -hmm. So one that isn't just coming in and destroying the market for everyone else. Mm -hmm. Like it's easy. If I were to take a couple hundred million dollars and then invest it in, you know, any project in the NFT world or, or across even a handful of projects, you can really move the floor and you can really um, pump up uh, certain projects. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think we have to tread lightly and be thoughtful about how we interact with, especially new and up and coming artists. Like we want to give the most important piece for a new artist getting off the ground is building a loyal and dedicated, uh, collector base mm -hmm. and, and community around what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And if it's just VCs coming in and buying up the art, that doesn't give them a chance to actually establish that real collector base, um, with, with the community, especially if the VCs are, are coming in and just buying a ton of it. Right. So, mm -hmm. uh, we have to make sure that we are doing things in a thoughtful way. So it'll probably be more on the commission pieces side. And then at the high end, you know, collecting one of one's early important historical projects on the blockchain, um, autoglyphs, you know, first generative stuff by Larva Labs, obviously CryptoPunks, Bored Apes, um, there's Chromie Squiggles, there's, uh, you know, Ringers, Fidenzas, like some of the very early important projects. Um, uh, Hackatow, there's a whole slew of X copies. I can just keep going on about some of the, mo mm -hmm. the more important artists on, on that are doing, um, that have done things for quite a while and been were very early blockchain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'll come in and, and purchase and acquire pieces from some of these artists uh, through the lens of are these kind of uh, more blue chip pieces. And then also then coming in and say, how can we create um, and leverage our entrepreneurial platform for artists? So, you know, on the back office side of, of True, uh, you know, we have a dozen or so folks that focus on nothing but supporting our entrepreneurs. So, you know, we have 300 over 300 founders. Um, 350 some founders, something like that. And we um, have a whole slew of different things from helping founders with hiring or crisis management um, or uh, additional fundraising to, you know, you name it. There's like the whole suite of different tools that we offer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we do founder camps and all these different events and things. And the artists need that support too. You know, artists are going through this for the first time and some of them come across a massive amount of wealth in a very short amount of time. How do they handle that stress? How do they, you know, who do they have to talk to? How do they figure out their taxes? How do they um, figure out the right platforms to mint on? How do they overcome some of the technical challenges of some of these platforms? Because some of the mm -hmm. artists are very skilled, uh, you know, with their digital tools, but not so much on the on the back end or um, blockchain side. So, you know, really thinking about, okay, yes, we can go and find an upcoming artist that we love that we want to commission artwork for, but how can we invite them into um, our company like we would any entrepreneur and give them access to all these resources. So you'll see True participating in a way that is more than just random throwing money at artists. It's going to be about working thoughtfully um, with artists and, and inviting them into hopefully something that's very special for them and, and provides mm -hmm. them with additional support. So when you mentioned about like supporting the artists before it was like, who did it first, right? Like Lava Lab or like all these like original OG creators um, who created early basically. And then for me, like as a regular person, when I look at like the, the, the board ape or like the art block, um, I think they're great, but after chatting with like my friends in the space, basically everyone was saying, you need to look at the community engagement and like stuff like that. So what does that mean for you? Like in, in the next generation of like figuring out who is the top creator, um, of course you have your amazing podcast, um, but like, how do you kind of figure out like who is going to make it next? And then what are some indicators that they would just to like identify they're going to make it? Yeah, I guess it really depends on on what you consider, you know, what quote unquote make it means. You know, <laughs> it's like I, I think that there is um there are a few things. One, you know, I, I'm I'm certainly gonna have a different taste and a certain a different lens than than someone else is collecting in this space, mm -hmm. right? And so there are some artists that I just haven't collected and they've they've appreciated quite a bit, but it's just because it's not for me. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I think that 
you have to find your tribe. And so mm-hmm. when, it, when you talk about communities and, and what they're doing, you know, I'm attracted to the things that uh, I, I think there's, and I'm just speaking for me personally, mm-hmm. I want an artist that's doing something new, unique and novel that I haven't seen done before. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to be visually attracted to what they're doing. I want to make sure they're not flooding the market and they understand the market dynamics and they're not just going to be printing out a hundred a day just to make money in the short term, mm-hmm. but I actually want to do this for the long term. Mm-hmm. And um, I want to make sure that it's a vision in the community that I'm really excited about, especially if it's a P- PFP project, like a profile photo project. Like those, there's so many of those out there that it's just, I feel that oh, that's the most dangerous piece of this, this landscape in the NFT side, in my opinion, because it's just anyone can spin up a series of 10,000 to go for a money grab. But the question mm-hmm. is who is doing something uh, with the, an eye towards, you know, the longevity of a project and the evolution of a project and supporting the project going forward so that they'll continue to, to um, support the community and do new and exciting things. Like a, a good example of that is I had the creators of the Woody's NFT project on, on my show and mm-hmm. Woody's was one that, they were doing a PFP project and um, it's these cute little wooden characters that look like they could be almost like um, animated, like cartoons on Disney or something. They're really, really well done. Um, and they, their focus is a couple of things. One, embracing the outdoors, like the physical real world outdoors and creating mm-hmm. games and content around getting more people outside. Their mm-hmm. little characters like look like that, like they have little wooden characters. So they look like little outdoorsy mm-hmm. type characters. Um, the second piece is, you know, how can they build an outdoor brand around this? So kind of a grassroots roots, bottoms up community driven outdoor brand. So imagine if you're building the next North Face or REI or something, and you're saying, hey, we're going to make tents and clothing and all these things. But rather than do it from a top down design perspective, we're going to use the community and the DAO to kind of do it from, from bottoms up. Mm-hmm. I believe a lot of new brands are going to be built this way. And it's just really cool to think of like, I could have a little Woody's character on my zip up jacket that I wear when I'm on my hikes, you know, and that could be mm. something that's kind of like one-off created for me as part of this whole process. It's something I'd be proud to wear. So it's just like, that's an example of somebody that, you know, that's not just a normal, like create a graphic, put it on the blockchain and walk away. It's somebody mm. that's like, okay, we're going to go a lot deeper here and try and, and bridge physical with digital and do some unique and compelling things that is going to take us a decade or longer to do go build. And that's how long great businesses take to be built. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's making sure that when I see a new project, that it's not just about how many discord members do they have? It's not about how mm-hmm. many Twitter followers do they have? It's and that's part of the reason why I liked in the podcast, to be honest, because I get a chance mm-hmm. to actually ask these questions of the founders themselves and say, how deep are you here? Are you here just to create something, you know, I don't say this, it's not the question I asked, but in my mind, I'm like, is it just, are you just here to make, you know, a short-term gain and, and you're going to check out in six months? Um, or is there something that's going to be bigger that could be the next Nike or something else? You know, it's like, so mm-hmm. I, um, that's how I, the lens I, I, I go through on the, on the PFP side. Mm-hmm. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I'm curious, like, I think that's super interesting. I never thought of it like, you know, the uh, the outdoor, the REI. I read about it in like business of fashion, like, you know, all these like iconic fashion brands started doing something with NFT. Like, uh, even like, you know, I was uh, looking at like Rebecca Minkoff did a uh, collaboration with OpenSea, I believe. Um, both founders were on the podcast previously. And I mean, I follow these trends, but I don't really know how, what is like the tangible value for um, a regular person now, like, you know, you definitely inspire me to like that way. Um, how NFT could be like commercialized or like how to bring it into like real life. So going back to you, right. Like just following your journey, you know, you, um, you have like created multiple different companies. I have so many questions on the product side, but, um, one thing is for you, I feel like you're really just like, an innovative, like creative thinker, like what kind of things, two part of the question. One part is like, who do you think is on your personal board of advisors? Cause you interact with like, you know, Chris Saka, Evan Williams, um, even like, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, you met him when he was just starting out Facebook. Right. So, and then Tim Ferriss, all these like really iconic people, like a, how do you kind of, um, build this network? And then how do you kind of like, um, um, I guess like who is on your personal board of advisors when it comes to like career or like these kind of like, who do you bounce off ideas with in general? And then the second piece is like, what kind of information do you consume to become you? Wow. Those, these are tough questions. 
Um, so on the personal advisors front, I would say that I have a handful of friends that, um, I look towards that are just good, close personal friends that are probably not the household names that you would think of. Mm -hmm. Um, definitely Tim Ferriss is on that list. No, just people that, Mm -hmm. you know, when you have a problem, Mm -hmm. you can give them a call. And it's going to be a casual conversation on the phone, not mm-hmm. something where you have to put up any walls or, you know, act or look a certain way, but you mm-hmm. can just say, I'm having this issue, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think that having, um, you know, you can place the calls to, you know, fortune 100 CEO, if you have the contacts, but if you don't have the relationship, mm-hmm. you're not going to, you're not going to really get what you need. And so totally. You know, I have just ex colleagues that I've worked with in the past, um, Mm -hmm. good personal friends for many years that, you know, that know you well, like they need Mm -hmm. to know the whole you so they can be like, Hey, maybe you shouldn't go build that other app and instead focus on this or like, you know, just call you on your shit. Cause that's what you need. You need someone that can like call you out and and knows Mm -hmm. you intimately enough to know where your weaknesses are and your strengths are. And so if you can, you know, I don't have a lot of. Um, I, I'm actually, I, I, I'm one of these people that I tend to have a really small group of really tight friends. Mm -hmm. And so I have probably 10 or so folks that I just would call up and, and be able to, to say this is going well or not so well and and get their take on and, and value their opinion, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's people that, that would do the same with me. You know, they would call me up and say, I'm having this issue as well. And it's like, we, we support each other like that. So I, mm-hmm. I would say trying to find friends like that almost more so than, than you know, what might look good uh, uh, on a press release, like because they're of some, some kind of like stature. Now, that said, if, if, there's, if there's questions you have around, you know, scaling businesses or something that's more tactical, th- those are certainly great mm-hmm. people to, to ask. But I, I would say for, for most things, it's, it's probably um, more emotional, more EQ driven than IQ, if that makes sense. Totally. When I listen to your show back in time, like uh, when I listen to your show with like Tim Ferriss or like the Quar podcast or Jason Calacanis, basically, I think I heard that like, you know, you were the kids with like tattoo and then you uh, wasn't really so happy with like you grew up in Vegas, not wasn't happy, but like, you know, you haven't grew up in Vegas. So you don't really identify it as home. Um, so what is your motivation come from? And then like, since like all your childhood friends are not your, not necessarily going to be your friends now, like how do you find these people that are like, you know, kind of thinking on your level as well as like, you know, um, yeah, just curious, like who, like, I, I wouldn't say who, which like their name or anything, but like, I'm just saying in general, what kind of things that do they do? Like, do they work in tech? Like, how do you kind of find these kind of peer group? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you're right. I, I did grow up. In, I grew up in Las Vegas. And for me, uh, once I got out of Las Vegas, it was a, mm-hmm. a very eye opening and, and wonderful thing. And that I realized there was a lot more to the world. Cause like, you're kind of closed off and you, if you don't travel a lot, you, that's all, you know, so it was nice to get to the Bay area and, and, and discover what that had to offer and just, mm-hmm. um, meet kind of like-minded people. And I think that's where I met a lot of my friends today was, was in the Bay area because mm-hmm. we were all technologists like working mm-hmm. in this industry and you know you kind of find your people that for me I'm like someone that likes to joke around and have fun mm-hmm. and just give each other shit and just like you know mm-hmm. poke at each other and just like in a in a, mm-hmm. in a fun happy kind of like loving way mm-hmm. and so I found my tribe of people that were kind of like that mm-hmm. and but but with the with the idea that um we're also very, uh, you know, high performing folks and that, you know, the, the folks that, that, um, they always say that like, you're the product of your five closest friends or whatever mm-hmm. it may be, you know, and it's, it's, I, I feel that it is absolutely true. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, there's, there's, I, I think it's just a lot of trial and error. It's a lot of meeting new people mm-hmm. and saying, do they, do they kind of, um, do, do, do they know how to, there's a lot of people that I've met that are mm-hmm. insanely high functioning, but they mm-hmm. can't have fun. And that's hard for me <laughs> because it's all work all the, all the time. And, mm-hmm. um, it's maybe it's the, the reason why I'm not the best CEO. And that is because 
I just want, I value downtime. I value work-life balance and to be the best and, and really kind of um, to take a company public or to, to, to really just whatever it may be you're trying to achieve, whether it's, you know, dominate a certain industry, it's oftentimes a very tough, um, brutal, uh, just you have to go all in on work. Mm. And I've never wanted to do that. I've always kind of valued, um, I don't know. I just, my biggest fear is that I would wake up one day and just realize that I spent the last, you know, X number of years of my life, just doing one thing and not actually finding the downtime and the value in that downtime. Mm -hmm. And so I've always tried to find friends that I would say my closest friends are not the CEOs of publicly traded companies. They're more just like people that are insanely good at one thing, but also know how to have a glass of wine in the evening and <laughs> hang out and listen to, you know, throw on some great vinyl and just like listen to some good music and go to live concerts and, you know, just do all the fun stuff that, that I think is just really the beautiful, relaxing part of life, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, those are the, those are my five friends. You know, I, I put Tim Ferriss in, in, in one of those, as one of those friends as well, like Tim, you know, since you mentioned him earlier, like he's, he's definitely one of my buddies that is, is like, he's somebody that you can get kind of like pissed off and grab you and try to wrestle you to the floor and like have fun. <laughs> Cause he's like, so like hardcore Tim, but he's also just, um, very serious. And when he goes into a discipline and wants to learn something new, you know, outcome the notebooks, outcome the pages of, of thoughts and research, and he will dive in, but he has that flip side as well. That, that, you know, emotional side that, that he spends a lot of time and effort on. Um, and, and I think that my friends are, uh, that I look towards for this. We all, there's a, there's a couple of things in common. One, I, I want to find people that are not stuck in their ways. And we all understand that we are flawed and will forever be flawed and have to be lifelong learners. So it's not about ever mastering anything. It's about um, knowing that this life is about just admitting that you don't know something. And that is actually a superpower. And that's actually how we learn. Mm -hmm. And that's all failure is, is just admitting that you, you didn't know something and, and, and learning and moving on. So when you remove that fear of failing, it allows you to take on a ton more risk. And then it's also just a beautiful thing because you don't have to take it so seriously and it doesn't mm -hmm. hit you as hard. Like back in the day, if I had a failure of a project, it would emotionally drag me down. And now I'm just like, ah, that was great. Learn something new and just move <laughs> on. And a lot of my friends are like that where mm -hmm. they just like, they've, we all have opened up and became, become vulnerable with each other. Mm -hmm. Like for a guy to tell another guy, you know, they're having a hard time in their, in their marriage or they're having a hard time you know, with raising kids or, you know, they are going to separate with their co-founder or whatever it may be, but being insanely vulnerable, it's, it's a very, uh, and I say guy, because, you know, I don't want to just make it about guys, but they're typically, uh, at least a lot of my guy friends growing up for sure, were <laughs> less emotionally available than most people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, um, I would say that, you know, I try to find people that, um, both, it, it doesn't matter what gender they are, but just finding people that are on that journey of being available to each other in that capacity. Mm. Yeah, for sure. I guess like, I feel you, I feel like it's so hard to open up. Not, I feel like not just for guys, but like for women too, like sometimes like to like show the vulnerable side, just because everyone's like hiding behind this like Instagram facade. Um, oh, for sure. Uh, yeah, I think everyone's, well, I wouldn't say everyone, but I do certainly feel like the life just definitely goes up and down and then, um, it's just crazy. It can get really crazy. And then it's always good to like, actually have real friends then, um, I guess like the Instagram friends, um, I'm curious. I was like listening to, um, your show with like Tim Ferriss, you were on his first show. And I think that conversation was way much more natural than the, not like than his show compared to like, the, the show with you but like it's more like 
a lot of these other conversations. Tim France doesn't, you know, curse or like doesn't drink a glass of wine when you guys talk about like stuff like that. And like, I feel oh, he like does when we do the random show, though. We do that every every quarter. Or so know. and yeah. he gets hammered. It's hilarious. Yeah, I was listening to um, the most recent like random show yesterday just to like get my mind like fresh on topic. It was so it was so fun to listening to you guys like just rambling about random stuff. So going back to your motivation, I think you mentioned in an interview like your 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 dad just like working in finance. And it's like a, it seems like you grew up in a regular family, and like I'm just curious like where does this motivation come from? And one thing I really admire about you is you started your career in like furniture online store company, and then you work for like tech TV, and then you started these companies, including mm-hmm. Dig, which got 38 million uh, users, and like, you know, and then, and then you, uh, that kind of, I don't know what that ended up with, but like you started another company, Milk, sold it to Google. And then you started two other companies, like the Oak Meditation Company or like the Zero um, Company. So basically you started so many companies and then you experienced the up and downs. Mm-hmm. Um, and then now you're still like, keep going at it with like the NFT things. Um, what motivates you to do all of these things? And then like, what is it like when one day you have like 38 million followers when one day crumbling down? I'm just curious, what is it like for you to go through this thing? And then like, what do you like kind of like experience and learn throughout this whole process? Yeah, well, there's a lot to, lot we could spend, uh, how much time do you have? <laughs> we, oh, like, we, could go, we could go hours. Only five hours, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh gosh, okay, so what motivates me? I think creativity motivates me. Like the idea of creating something new. It's always been that way for me. I just want to tinker and build new stuff and just think of things that nobody's done before and just try them out. Mm -hmm. And and the majority of the stuff that I've done that falls in that umbrella has failed Mm -hmm. and that's okay. And that's fine. And no one knows. No one knows the failed things. No, no, it's, it's good. It's, it's, it's like the number, the, the number of times like, um, we have to fail. Many times we just don't realize that we're failing um, when we're building products. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's, it's like you try some features out, they may not work, but that's not, you wouldn't call that a failure. You just like, Oh, well, that didn't work. Let's move on to the next feature. And you try something out. But Mm -hmm. in reality, we're just failing every single day. And Mm -hmm. it's, it's um, once I became comfortable with that, I was not always comfortable with that. That was a huge unlock for me. So when dig Mm -hmm. failed, I was really depressed. I was like, um, I, I, I tried to blame it on other people initially, and ultimately it was my fault. I get the, cause it, I'm the one that started the company. So I hired the wrong people or I, I didn't motivate the, the people that we hired. Cause we had a lot of great people and I didn't, you know, um, have the, uh, the wherewithal to manage folks. I'd never managed anyone before. I'd never mm-hmm. coached anyone before. Um, I was horrible at kind of, uh, I I think the the one thing I was good at was kind of setting crazy product vision ideas, but really poor on the execution and follow through. And um, I didn't really care about the details when I should have. Um, Yeah. There's a lot of things I messed up on. So it's, it was realizing the big unlock for me at that moment was stop hiding the things that you don't know and come out and, and raise your hand, even though it may look, you may look silly for a moment and say, I don't know this. Can you help me? And so that was something I had a really hard time with. I didn't want to look foolish in front of, you know, my peers or people that I, 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 you know, mentors that I really respected, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I had all these great investors, you know, I had Mark Andreessen and Reed Hoffman and a bunch of just fantastic people that invested in dig. And I was too scared to ask for help because I would, I looked at them and I said, wow, they're at this caliber that like, if I ask this silly question, I'm going to look foolish. But then mm-hmm. I saw all of the best CEOs, um, other friends of mine that went on to succeed, uh, embrace that. And, mm-hmm. and I, I realized that was a huge problem I had. And, and once I was able to flip that and, and stop down and admit that you don't know something, um, mm-hmm. that was, that was massive. So that, that for me, uh, has been a huge unlock, but the motivation side of it has never been something where I had to wake myself up and splash water in my face and say, you got to do this. It's never been that it's always been just this natural internal drive of wanting to create. 
and wanting mm-hmm. to build. I always, I always, there was a, like many years ago, maybe over a decade ago, uh, some reporter asked me like what, what, like kind of, I wanted to, like, it was like, you know, what you want to be known for, but like more or less one of those types of questions. And I, and I said, you know, I don't care if I, I just want to be known for trying crazy ideas, crazy mm-hmm. shit. Like, mm-hmm. like he went out and he tried some crazy stuff and, and it was, you know, even the stuff that failed, I think people can look at and be like, well, that was a wild idea. Like, I'm glad that existed. And that's all I want. I want to try wild ideas because that's, there's so much, it's so much fun and excitement when you launch something new that's mm-hmm. never been done before. Like that's amazing, you know, mm-hmm. and sometimes it works and it's, it's so much fun. So that that's where I get my drive from is that those moments mm-hmm. of excitement when you see, you know, what ends up, what starts off as hundreds mm-hmm. of people trying something new and then ends up with millions of people trying something new. And, and, you know, with, with zero, I had no idea that was going to be a massive, you know, intermittent fasting and having a fasting app was going to be that big. And then <laughs> we, we hired a, a nanny to help out with our childcare. And, um, we have a couple of little girls and, uh, she goes, you, she goes, you created zero. She has no idea about dig or anything else I've ever done. And I was like, I was like, yeah, she's like, oh my God, I use that app. And I was like, oh, that's crazy. <laughs> I'll be known for the intermittent fasting app, but it's just like, really, it's really cool to see, you know, I mean, that one was really special because you see a lot of people that are getting healthy. Like they're, they're, they're losing weight. They're, you know, correcting their type two diabetes. Mm-hmm. Um, they're having better fasting uh, glucose levels. Like there, there's a lot of, of positive things that, that have come out of that one. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm curious, like, so two part, one part is like, you mentioned like your, a lot of your drive was like creativity. Like, is there something happening when you were younger, like your childhood or something kind of like influenced the way that you think? And um, yeah. And then like the other part, we can jump into the product part later, but I'm just, yeah, it's just a random. Yeah. Part. It's a, it's a great question. I think there's a couple of things. One, I was surrounded by a household household of builders. Mm-hmm. So we were standard kind of middle class at times, lower middle class when my dad had to declare bankruptcy when I was like 15. But, um, we, we had, um, the one thing I always respect about my father, um, and my mom is they were both entrepreneurs. So my dad had a little bookkeeping business where he kept books for like local, um, other local businesses. Um, And he sold him life insurance prior to that. Um, And he was always kind of in business for himself. Um, Mm -hmm. There was one time he worked for a bigger company, but it was always about, you know, they were always kind of like, how can we have little side hustles? And this was like back Mm -hmm. in the early nineties or whatever, late (laughs) eighties. And my mom had a, um, she did nails and then she, uh, she did that out of the house. Actually, she had a little side office in the house. And then she did uh, flower arrangements and then gift baskets. Um, mm-hmm. So she used to just be building at the house. Like I'd walk mm-hmm. into the house during the holidays and see gift baskets mm-hmm. everywhere. And she'd be wrapping up packages and like building mm-hmm. these things. And uh, I remember just thinking, oh, a job is what you create. A job is just that you go and you, you decide what you want to build and you go form a business. Mm-hmm. And so when I was 16, my dad took me down to the, the business um, uh, there was like a business bureau in Las Vegas and we filed Mm -hmm. an LLC called United web. And it was my Mm -hmm. first business and he made me fill out the paperwork. And so I had to put my name in there and all that stuff. And he had to like, to get to be 18. So you had to like sign it and all that stuff. But I had my own business and he helped me open a a checking account, a business checking account and took me to the bank. Cause you, you know, you went into the bank to do all these things. And Mm -hmm. it was like, um, it was just that it was like, this is what you do, son. Like, this is how it works, you know? And so mm-hmm. for me, you know, I, I, I never graduated from college and I went off to, to work in the Valley and I was working for other people just to get out in the Bay area. But I knew I always wanted to do my own thing. I knew software development was kind of something I was really into. And so mm-hmm. it was just kind of built in at that early stage that, my parents would have always been proud if I started a business, you know, and that's not the same for everyone. So I, I, I know that that's, that's challenging for the, those parents that want you to get that, you know, doctor's you know, degree or whatever it may mm-hmm. be that you're going after. So mm-hmm. my parents were not in that camp. I was very, very lucky. Mm, I love it. I feel like entrepreneurial stuff. It's just definitely, I don't know. It's kind of in your blood. Like it's not really something that people, I don't know. For me, it was just never like I adapted later on or anything, but, 
Um, did you notice at a young age you were doing things like, did you ever have like the classic lemonade stand or did you do anything like that? It's crazy because I think in when I was in elementary school, I started writing for the school newspaper and I started English newspaper in China when I was like 16. So I went to a private international high school. So everyone's studying abroad and like we don't have to be honest in China, you don't really have extracurricular activity. You just study. And I just wanted to like, because if we're, we're applying to schools, we have to have some extracurricular activity. So I just started the newspaper to um, ask people to like write about the clubs, like the Taekwondo clubs or like, you know, the volunteering club or something to just write about these like activities. So we can send it to the school. So we will have something on our resume. And like, so I started like writing this English newspaper in my high school. And then like a lot of, I just got like half of our class or as our like contributors. So every Friday we'll sell it to the parents. So like everyone's mom is like, we love this, but yeah, that's my entrepreneur. Did that feel good when you, when you do that for the first time? Was it like something yeah. you're like, oh, I want to do more of this. Like it. Yeah, it was crazy. Um, yeah, I remember I actually literally went to um, uh, actual newspaper printing company as my parents who so took me there just because I was like, I don't know, 13 or something. And then like I had to physically picking out what's what paper we're using, how we're printing it. It was completely new to me, but I feel like I was running Vogue at that moment. But <laughs> it was uh, it was pretty crazy. Yeah. What what about you? So I know that you took on these like projects but like I'm like what was your like first like entrepreneurial experience yeah. well I mean I always wanted to my dad was had a uh, he turned our garage into a woodworking shop so he always mm -hmm. had me kind of like building stuff stuff with wood and so I was at a very young age I learned how to use all the saws in the garage and and all of all of that stuff so I was just trying to like <clears throat> just like I was actually just building stuff to like that would really upset my parents at that point because I, I remember I got some we couldn't afford the Nike Airs that had um that it would show you actually the air pocket on the side but we but mine said Nike Air and so I wanted to confirm that it was actually a Nike Air so I took it in the garage and I cut the heel open and I found the air pocket hidden inside of it with the saw and then I tried to install springs in the back with a hot glue gun so I could jump higher Cause I was mm -hmm. thinking like, if I could jump onto my shoes with the Springs, it could help me slam dunk like Michael Jordan. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what I was doing at like age 11 or something. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was just like, I, I remember always thinking like in seeing people build things like tennis shoes or, or physical objects. I was like, that's the coolest job ever. You get to dream up what's going to be the shoes going to look like. That's so freaking cool. And so I was like, I want to make a shoe better. And so, you know, it was like that idea of just what can I build in the garage, um, you know, to try and to try and make something that's never been made before. So it was just always, always there with me. I love it. I'm curious, like, just sounds like you're a great product person. Have you thought about partnering up with like a business person to make a business? Because I think startup have two sides, right? Like, so one person builds something, the other person sells something. I think I, I do think that you are great at selling, but you have to focus on something, right? Like you can't just um, do everything. Um, I'm curious, like when it comes to starting business, you have started multiple pretty successful businesses. Um, even like some may not end up as big as it used to be or whatever, but it, you still get there before. Right. And as well as like, you know, you are working in venture. Um, when it comes to business, like there's two parts, one part is like building a great product. And then the number two is like selling the great product to everybody, to investor, to the customer. What do you identify as your superpower? In this whole game, I remember you mentioned you hired uh, um, Jay Adelson, who has worked on a startup and then eventually went public, public, and then you ask him to give him some stock and then like helping you starting Dig, right? Like, I mean, I think it's a great move. Um, like what happened there? Like, how do you identify what's your strengths and then how do you kind of like fix your weaknesses with like other people? Yeah, those are great questions. I, I think that um, just being honest with yourself on, on like we mentioned earlier about admitting when you don't know something and then understanding that if you don't know it and you go to get schooled up 
in it as you should, mm -hmm. um, do you enjoy doing it? So like, you know, I'd never managed anyone before. I'd never fired our, anyone before. I didn't know what a proper interview process looked like. Mm -hmm. um, once I eventually raised my hand and went to, you know, some people that I really respected to, to learn these skills, um, it was it something that I enjoyed doing. And the answer is yes, until a point. So, mm -hmm. you know, when Zero was growing and we got it off the ground, uh, you know, the intermittent fasting app, it got to a certain point and I said, I don't want to do this anymore. I had worked with Mike Mazur, um, who worked with me at Dig and, and ran um, kind of all of our, our marketing and PR and was, mm -hmm. is also a fantastic product person, helped on the product side there as well. Um, he, he was into fasting and, and he said, you know, I can take this and uh, scale it and take it to the next level. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm great at that up to 10 to 15 people. Mm -hmm. Then things slow down and I'm a really fast paced kind of like rapid iteration type person. Um, so I, I like, and once I identified that, then it was very easy because then, yeah, I can bring someone in like Mike or someone else to run the business mm -hmm. and then take it to, to where it is today. So, mm -hmm. you know, I realized that at Hodinkee as well, Hodinkee is another one, you know, I was CEO there for a couple of years. We started off when I was there, there was four of us or five of us total, you know, now mm -hmm. there's over a hundred people at Hodinkee and I realized I could just, I, I got it to around 25 people or so. Mm -hmm. and, you know, around 8 million a year in revenue. And I was like, I can't, I can't do this. Like, this is not <laughs> what I enjoy doing. It's more management, less product. Mm -hmm. And so then we brought in another CEO and, you know, that business will do over a hundred million in revenue this year, which is crazy. So that is, um, that's where I tap out. And so I, I'm good at the early creative iteration ideation phase. And then, so, so just being true to yourself, I think in saying like, these are my strengths. This is what I really enjoy is, mm -hmm. is the first step. For sure. Um, speaking of like creating great products, I was trying like both of your app yesterday. So like, I mean, I know Dick before, but like, I mean, I was trying zero and Oak meditation. I love the design and I feel like this is like, I wish I discovered this earlier, to be honest, because I was constantly feel like, and it's just, I feel like I need to like actually meditate. I like, I love these apps. I love the design and I'm curious when it comes to designing a product, like what goes into it? Can you walk us through maybe like one things that you've designed, like from the beginning, like how you identify the problem to actually putting it into a product. I really like the details of the product. Like even like those little videos, it was break down to like couple second by couple second instead of like the whole video because I would have just stopped instead of like flipping. Yeah. I mean there's a there's a lot to to break down there. I think that well let's just take uh oak for example the meditation app and then we can jump to others mm -hmm. if you'd like. So the 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 world doesn't need another meditation app. Um there's plenty but what we wanted to do at that time and this was years mm -hmm. ago now mm -hmm. um was create a meditation app that was, so one, one of the beautiful things about meditation is it is, is evergreen content. Meaning like, mm -hmm. it's not like meditation gets better with new information or mm -hmm. it gets stale with old information. Right. Yeah. Um, the, the, the methods are pretty, uh, tested and, and tried and true at this point. Right. So, yeah. um, our thinking there was there's a lot of apps out there that are charging you the five, eight, 10, $12 a month. Mm. Um, for the same information, which is effectively they record an MP3 and they release it and, and charge you for the stuff. And hopefully they've add additional value with additional content. A lot of them have built out their catalog and such that there is a lot of value there. Mm -hmm. But for us, it was like, there's a lot of people that just aren't going to build up for that. So how can we, you know, give this away? <clears throat> also, there's a very popular form of meditation called uh, transcendental meditation, which is our TM, which is a form of um, um, mantra based meditation that they're charging, mm -hmm. you know, $1,500 to $2,000 to take the course. Mm -hmm. And that is that that's information has just been out there for so long, like, mm -hmm. let's just give it away. So we built out a, a really detailed, awesome uh, mantra course, a very uh, lightweight Vipassana style mindfulness meditation course. Mm -hmm. Um, and then one of the best, I think one of the best kind of timers out there, and then some really amazing kind of, um, yogic breathing techniques that we could put into the app as well. And then we just decided to give it all away. And so, um, built that, launched it, 
the product, what, what the product building looks like is we, we kind of identified the pieces where we want to play. Mm-hmm. Um, there's in, with any new product, there's always the temptation and there's always, and this is not, this is just the human nature is like, we think, wouldn't it be great if we did this? You know, mm-hmm. that's always a question that comes up and, and it, it's great because it, it, it's a fantastic question for creating new, new ideas, but mm-hmm. it's a horrible question for, for scope. So you want to, you want to prevent scope creep from happening. So you're not trying to boil the ocean. So for us, it's, you know, taking the 20 or 30 ideas that we want to do and narrowing it down to the three to five ideas that we absolutely must do for a first version of the product. So really mm-hmm. tabling a bunch of stuff till later. And then putting that down, um, creating a, an initial 1.0 that you can get to in you know two to three months and launching, and then getting the best possible feedback, which is not internal, but customer and mm-hmm. iterating and modifying from there. And so, you know, we then said, we want this to be beautiful and elegant and lightweight and simple. And so we went for a very watercolor kind of painting uh, style design, um, worked with a fantastic illustrator to create original watercolor paintings for the entire app. And then, um, you know, just kind of built it out from there and, and launched it and did a few iterations and got to a really awesome place. And, and now it just exists as a, f- a free resource. And, you know, it's had, you know, at this point, it's, I'm sure it's well over a million downloads plus, um, it's gotta be approaching the millions at this point, but it's like mm-hmm. just a great little resource for people that want a free meditation app. So there wasn't anything fancy there. That wasn't really a business though. That was like, we knew that was something that, um, for us, it could potentially turn into something bigger, but we were happy with where it ended up and didn't see the need to go and try and feature chase all of the other apps Mm -hmm. because it is such a crowded market. For sure. So you have like worked for a Google venture as well as like now true venture. Like what is, do you enjoy the VC experience? I feel like a lot of it's like a sourcing deal as well as like, you know, learning something super rapidly. Like how do you kind of like build up the network or like maintain your personal network to, you know, get the great deals. And then the other part is like when you are analyzing all the deals or like analyzing like what could be the future of everything like how do you quickly become an expert in a particular subject for you maybe it's like nft or crypto yeah well it's a great question um i i do love venture it's it is fun especially at true um i loved my time at google ventures it was a fantastic three years um, but it was clear that they, there were certain things that you could and, and, and couldn't do at Google, um, not because of the team, but because of the fact that it was a, a corporate run VC. And so they just have a different, slightly different mandate than, than traditional venture. Mm-hmm. And so um, I, after um, I was done with my investing there, I, I ended up leaving and um, joined True because I had raised money from True three pre- previous times as an entrepreneur. And it was just people that I knew well, and I just loved mm-hmm. their kind of whole ethos and the way that they put EQ before all else. And it was very low ego firm. And there was just a lot of things to love. So, um, you know, been at True a few years now. And in terms of like new deals, I think you know, majority of our deals, something like 90 plus percent come from our existing founder portfolio. So, you know, 350 plus founders, all referring in new entrepreneurs for us to look at. Mm-hmm. It's a great, um, not only testament to kind of the product that we've built, that these founders would be willing to um, refer other founders to us, but we love it when uh, it's people that we already trust and know that are bringing in new deals as, mm-hmm. as new deals uh, as sourcing for us. So um, a lot of it comes through that. And then I would say, you know, we want to find those um, EQ driven founders that mm-hmm. are vulnerable, that are, that do want to work with a firm that operates this way, um, mm-hmm. that want to have less corporate like structure. Like we're not the VC that you have to come in and pitch a boardroom full of VCs, mm-hmm. uh, wearing sweater vests. Like we're very much <laughs> like, we're very much like, let's grab a coffee. Mm-hmm. Like for us, we grab a coffee. If the idea sounds great, we fund you like it's that easy. And, and the reason why we built that process is because over a coffee is a much better way to get to know someone personally, to have some real conversations rather than some weird structured pitch that is done at the boardroom level, right? Mm-hmm. At, at some kind of long table, like I've done so many times in, in, on Sand Hill Road. So mm-hmm. um, we, there, there, we will lose deals, but oftentimes those aren't 
necessarily the types of founders we, we want to work with. Like there's VCs that will, if it's a hot deal, they'll send out their private jet and pick you up and take you to the office and wine and dine you and do all these really crazy things. And it's, it's a very common thing. It happens all the time. Mm-hmm. And we don't do that. We don't play that game mm-hmm. because that's not like, we don't need to, like we take our carry or we take our management fees and we don't spend them on jets. We spend them on mm-hmm. resources to help entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of just in our DNA. It's, it's kind of who we are. And it's, um, uh, if, you know, when we like the most recent deal that I did was art blocks, you know, we, mm-hmm. we, we led that round, Sorry. um, yeah. the last round of financing. And he was one that had VCs throwing jets at them to like, cause it was such a hot <laughs> deal. And, um, you know, a couple of things stood out for him. And I think uh, Eric would tell you, this is why he did the deal. One, we were investors that were using the product months before. Mm-hmm. And so we'd actually, you know, I'd been a collector and, and been talking to him casually, not in terms of like, Hey, you should raise some money from us. Mm-hmm. It was like, if you need capital ever, we should talk, but there was never any pressure. And it was just like, mm-hmm. let's just be friends first and get to know each other. And how can I help you first? Like, like, let's not make this a financial transaction. Let's make this about a friendship that's going to last for decades. Mm-hmm. And, and then, you know, when he had every single major VC beating down his door, when they blew up, like, you know, a couple months ago, he was like, Kevin, like, this all sounds like this is chaos. Like you are like, true seems like a pretty like level-headed organization. Like, and that's how we won the, that deal. And don't get me wrong. We'll lose a lot of deals because of that kind of more laid back approach. I wouldn't say it's laid back. It's more kind of like less aggressive. We just don't want to mm-hmm. be in your face. We're not here to pressure you to sign some like weird paper that you've never haven't had time to look at. Like mm-hmm. we're here to like, let us help first. And, and, and if that works and you like us, it'll mm-hmm. all work out, you know, the, you, then you'll want to raise from us and you'll see the the value we, we bring as a friend and partner versus a transaction. I love it. Um, so we have a one minute fire round. So we'll let's start do it. On. Okay. Okay. So first of all, what's your favorite book? Oh gosh. Um, probably Zen, the authentic gate. Uh, who made the biggest impact in your career? Uh, definitely. Um, I would say equally in different ways, my mother and my father, um, my father and that showing me how to get back up again after being losing a job and Mm -hmm. uh, declaring bankruptcy and watching him start his own business after that was huge. And my mother for teaching me to, um, uh, disregard some of the bad habits of my father. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, who would you invite to your dinner party? Um, honestly, my favorite dinner parties are really close friends. Um, and then also people that are just doing big, bold, wild ideas. So I don't care if they'll succeed or fail. I just like the people that are just like, you know, uh, there's like a handful of entrepreneurs, like the Philip Rosedales of the world where, you know, I had them on my foundation episodes way back when, where Mm -hmm. you sit there and you, you at a dinner party, you sit next to Philip and he created second life way back in the day. And you have a conversation for a half hour with Philip and you'll have heard seven or eight new ideas that he has about the most wide ranging, craziest shit you've ever heard. <laughs> and you're like, I love every cell of what you are as a human, because like you just is like, <laughs> you're just thinking about just the chaos in there, the chaos in that brain. It's so beautiful. So that, that's those are the type of people I like to put at the dinner table. Love it. Uh, where can we find you outside of work? Outside of work, just uh, crypto Twitter at Kevin Rose there um, is probably the main place. And then uh, proof.xyz and modernfinance.xyz for both podcasts. What's last, last question? What's your information diet look like? Crypto Twitter first, a handful of different uh, discords. So probably a dozen or so different discords I bounce in and out of. Um, on the NFT side, Flamingo Dow has been great alpha for me and being a part of that has been great. Um, I would say overarching stuff. I have, um, tech meme is kind of like, it does a good job at kind of giving a summary of all of what's going on, like in the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. And then, um, 
you know, just kind of general, big, broad uh, macro trends would be the FT or Wall Street Journal for, for kind of just like, you know, or Barron's for just kind of like seeing what's going on in the markets in general. Um, and then a handful of podcasts. Um, you know, uh, Tim's show is great. Uh, Mountain Cloud Zen Center does one that helps on the more uh, Zen side of things, that for my, my meditation practice. Um, and then Bankless is great. Um, there's a few other uh, shows that I, I love. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Kevin, for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. This was a ton of fun. Thank you.